You're listening to Searching for More, a podcast of the Diocese of Arlington. Today we're talking about transgenderism and gender identity with Mary Hassan, Kate O'Bearn Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. As a culture, as a society, we can't lose you know, our, our grasp of what's true and, and what's false. Yeah. And the reality is you cannot change a person's sex. And sex is whole body, whole person. Here, Mary explained the risks and truth related to gender identity with host Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer, Catholic Diocese of Arlington. Let's jump right in. Mary, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you so much, Billy. It's wonderful to be here and to have this conversation. This is an important one, certainly. Before we get into the main topic, talk about your work with the Ethics and Public Policy Center, what your role is there and what you do. Sure. I'm the Cato Byrne Fellow uh, at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. So I'm an attorney by profession, but I work on public policy, uh, which means laws, regulations, uh, the cultural issues, and really focusing on the intersection of faith, women, sexuality, family, those sorts of things. Very good. We're going to get into a lot of the the issues related to gender, um, the Equality Act, and so on. What are some other issues, though, that you've you've, uh, gone down that road in your career? So a number of things from uh, talking about opportunities for women and what a a healthy family policy looks like, Mm -hmm. you know, how you incentivize people to prioritize family life and and yet open up economic opportunities. So that's one thing. Catholic education is a huge part of of what I focus on, partly because we have so many Catholic children who are being educated not within sort of the Catholic education umbrella. And as the culture veers in a different direction, I think Catholic education is just tremendously important. So that's something I talk a lot about. Absolutely. So uh, there have been a lot of efforts lately to redefine what sex is and, and what gender is and then how they relate to one another and what we can define and redefine. That's been something that's coming up a lot, especially in um, society, but it always works its way into public policy. That Naturally, that's, that's what occurs. One of the um, most kind of critical ways that we've seen is within the Equality Act, which is a piece of legislation. Before we get into kind of the backstory of a lot of these things, talk about the Equality Act, what it is and why it's it's important. Sure, the Equality Act is a a piece of federal legislation and it has been proposed for numerous years. The, The issue now is that there's worry that it actually will pass because it has passed the House. And with the Senate being, you know, so closely divided, there's concern that it will pass. But the the crux of the concern is this, that it redefines sex. It redefines that idea of who we are as a person. And then it also expands the the possibilities for liability, whereas civil rights law in the past has, has been very limited and targeted. And... Um, there's something called public accommodations that the law reaches. It reaches things like restaurants and roads and and stadium, the the places where commerce and people flow. But the Equality Act expands that. So it expands the liability to include uh, faith-based organizations that are working in the public square, whether that's a, a homeless shelter or an adoption agency. It includes individuals. It includes things um, as vague as public gatherings, which could include uh, or subject, let's say, a Catholic high school to liability if they open up their building for a high school basketball game. So it's a a public gathering. Mm -hmm. And someone comes in and and finds that the bathrooms are not divided by gender identity, but instead respect the biological distinctions, they could be suing. So it, it broadens that sense of liability. But then it also, and this is tremendously worrisome both to the to the bishops, but to people of all faith, um, it specifically, by its terms, the Equality Act precludes anyone from using the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as a defense or as a claim under it. So that's been the Religious Freedom Re- uh, Restoration Act, which is often called RIFRA, right. um, is an important piece of legislation that, that was passed with bipartisan support, near unanimous support, signed by uh, President Clinton way back when, I think it was 1993. And it was specifically designed to ensure that laws do not burden people of faith in, in ways that are, are not consonant with, with our, our tradition and our valuing of mm. religious freedom. So it just requires the government to engage in a balance, and the courts to engage in a balancing test. And if you can show that your religious freedom is burdened, then the government has to show that there's a compelling reason for them to put that burden on a believer, and that they've chosen the most restrictive um, 
or the least restrictive way to do that. So it's it's been a law that yeah. has been uh, a tremendous part of our um, litigation landscape, but but in a way to to really balance interests. So the Equality Act says can't use it. It's not available if someone brings a claim for sex discrimination under the Equality Act. By its terms, it says you cannot uh, use the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as a defense. And that is a huge, huge red flag because, as I mentioned earlier, the Equality Act um, creates additional risk for anyone who's operating in the public square who holds beliefs in um, the truth about male-female sexual yeah. difference or marriage, that all of a sudden those beliefs can open you up to a, uh, a lawsuit or a claim of, of sex discrimination, which really could drive faith-based um, organizations out of the public square. Yeah, or, or just it would subject religious organizations to persecution because like mm-hmm. it's not like the church mm-hmm. is going to cease to exist. We're, you know, we, we, no, we've weathered true. a lot of persecution yeah. in the past. It puts us at direct odds with government in a way that I don't know that that's ever happened. That I mean, it's, what, you, you you're an expert in this. Is anything like the Equality Act and how broad it is? Because I can't think of a sector of society that would not be impacted by this in a negative way. Has anything like this been introduced that would be so broad-based? No. I mean, this is, and even if you were just a small government kind of person and you really didn't care about religious liberty, et cetera, if you looked at this act and you saw how sweeping it was, you would have concerns because it it really vastly extends the reach of the federal government in ways mm-hmm. that we have not seen before. And that is unprecedented. It's also unprecedented to have a piece of federal legislation specifically say the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is off limits. We're, yeah. So what it does is it tips the scales. It turns civil rights law into sort of a winner-take-all kind of thing, which is, is not how our country has approached that. Yeah, and, and RIFRA was created for a very good reason, right? Mm-hmm. That religion is uh, protected in our country. It's in, protected you know, through our Constitution. This is part of our foundation. To explicitly kind of deny that is a very scary thing. Because yeah. even if the law itself didn't say why they didn't want that included, mm-hmm. well, mm-hmm. the next step or two is going to make it very clear why. Yeah. Well, and we've already seen a change of rhetoric, which is very troubling. So, for example, people who are people of faith and have a religious objection, let's say to, let's say you're a Catholic physician and you uh, you believe in the integrity of the body and using your skills for healing. And, and so when if you have a teenager coming to you who says, I'm transgender, I, I want to have a double mastectomy, the, a, a Catholic physician would say, whoa, wait a minute, this is not, not in accord with my sound medical judgment. But it right. it's also violates my, my deeply held beliefs mm-hmm. that we don't just destroy body functions and, and parts of the body unless there's, there's some health reason, you know, some yeah. medically indicated reason. But under the Equality Act, this uh, a Catholic physician, for example, would be forced to do that or face a discrimination claim and would not be able to say, hey, I have a religious objection to doing this. Someone else, it, it doesn't change the law for everyone else. This person can go find a physician, I'm sure, to, to do that particular procedure. Um, but people should be free to say, you know, if if I really have um, a compelling reason of conscience that I, I just can't do this kind of thing, I think it's wrong. Yeah. Our, our government, our, our whole culture has been set up to respect that. But we've seen a flip so that a person who's doing that now is, is called someone who's um, discriminating on the basis of religion or engaging in religious refusal, refusing people their rights. Um, which doesn't take into account the reality that they have um, a right to religious liberty that yeah. doesn't come from the state. Right, and we've seen something like this with the Colorado Baker, right? Mm-hmm. It's a, kind of the famous yeah. case that we've all yeah. you know heard about. And what was really interesting and sad is that once that case was over, they got hit with another lawsuit yeah. of a very similar nature where they're being forced to do something they don't agree with. Um, let me play devil's advocate mm-hmm, for a second. Sure. So there, I'm sure that people are like, so somebody wants to, you know, go through a medical procedure that's not necessary. Um, we have, you know, procedures for all kinds of aesthetic adjustments mm-hmm, to people's, mm-hmm. you know, um, to bodies, and and you know, the, the church doesn't always speak out right. about that. So if somebody want, you know, believes they're a gender different than what you know they were born as, and they want to change. 
why do we have the right to to refuse them that opportunity if we're going to be a doctor, we're going to be a whatever the, the profession might be? What's what's the argument against so, that? So there are two things. One is just um, sound medical practice. We respect the judgment of a physician. The law right. doesn't compel a doctor, for example, to do an appendicitis on, I mean, to do an, an appendix removal mm -hmm. on a person if he really doesn't think they have appendicitis. Yeah. And, and maybe for a time there's going to be physicians who are going to differ about whether you should do that now or not. In other words, there's respect for the judgment of the physician, whereas this law says we're not allowing you any discretion. This is sort of like consumer-driven medicine. If this person comes in and says, I want this procedure, you have to do that or you're discriminating. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't do that in other areas of the law, even with um, plastic surgeons. I know plastic surgeons who, who get a lot of requests um, exactly. related to transgender issues, but they will say they, they get requests from people who are looking to fix other problems in their lives by having some sort of surgery. Yeah. And they don't just automatically do what the, the patient asks. They use their best medical judgment mm -hmm. as to whether the procedure is wise, whether they can do it, um, and, and benefit the patient. So yeah. that's, that's one whole area. But then I just as a, a culture, as a country, we don't want to be the kind of society that, that runs sort of roughshod over people's conscience-based objections. We want to respect that. And, and if you think about how we've treated conscientious objectors, for example, That's in right. military service, you know, we, we recognize, okay, some people just, it's so deep within them that this is, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to force them to go out and take up a gun and, um, right. you know, shoot someone. We, and, and that benefits society. We want people of integrity. Yeah. We want people to live by their deepest convictions. And those convictions. people are typically celebrated. And it's all exactly. about the same people who are in support of the Equality Act, which is peculiar. Like, yeah. why are we suddenly comfortable with the idea of compelling people to do things mm -hmm. that violate their religious convictions, their professional advice, their medical mm -hmm. advice, whatever it might be? What's changed? So the Equality Act didn't appear yeah. out of nowhere. This is something that's kind of developed over time. Where did it come from? Well, it, so in terms of, of what's changed, we've seen sort of people nibbling around this and trying to compel physicians to do things. We've seen that in the abortion context. Mm. And so far, we've had specific regulations and, and statutes that protect the conscience rights of uh, a physician, for example, to say, I just can't do an abortion. I, I am not going to do that, and the law will not compel them. Mm. So we've respected that, even in very contentious issues. I think part of the problem here is that when you're talking about uh, the whole issue of, of um, someone who is presenting with a transgender identity, one thing that, that is very typical is that person is seeking outside validation, outside affirmation of this identity. In other words, that's sort of how it becomes real because the transgender identity, a gender identity is really your self-perception. Mm -hmm. You know, your self-perception regardless of your sex. That's typically right. how it's defined. So if you perceive yourself uh, to be male and yet your, your body is female, you are female, you're going to be looking for ways to express what you consider your, your masculine identity but you take offense and you find it, it um, unvalidating or whatever right. the word might be uh, if someone, if people do not recognize that. Because yeah. again, sort of the core of that whole idea is that your, your identity is confirmed by others' validation. Whereas, yeah, uh, you know, that, I, that makes sense. I get what you're saying. Yeah, so, so therefore it becomes important not to have a physician say, you know, I just can't do that. I, I don't amputate healthy breasts. <laughs> yeah, right. A female, even if you feel like they should be gone, I just don't do that. But, you know, go find another physician. Instead of respecting that, there's this, this push in the law and increasingly in the culture to say, no, you have to do that. You yeah. have to do that because otherwise you're hurting the person's feelings, et, et cetera. And, and, you know, we have a better answer as Catholics, and, and that's sure. that we acknowledge the dignity of every person. Every person is a son or daughter of the Lord, and we want to treat them with dignity and with kindness. But by the same token, you know, we understand that some things are true, some things are good, and and, and we don't we, – we have the right not to be forced into doing something that we believe is – bad, morally bad, bad for the person, but also just not true. You know, why should we be pulled into someone else's narrative of, 
you know, who they are, that they have an identity that is at odds with their biological sex, when we know the truth is they are male or female. That's, that's you, you know, with transgender medicine, as it's called, they don't change sex. You cannot change a person's sex. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm a, an attorney, so I, I look at things like informed consent documents. And if you look at the informed consent documents at the gender clinics where they're uh, doing these, giving these hormone treatments and, and doing surgeries, they're very specific on those legal documents. They don't purport to say to a, a young female, you're becoming male by undergoing these procedures. They say, we are giving you these hormones which will masculinize or feminize your appearance and will affect the function of your body. So they're very limited. Yeah. But the promise, what kids are hearing and young people, young adults are hearing in the culture is that they can be whoever they want to be, regardless of the limits of their body. And it's, it's just not true. Well, and that's been a problem with society. I mean, this has been going on for quite a while, that we have prioritized how I feel or what makes me mm -hmm. happy. Like, even hear parents say it, and I don't think they mean what they're saying, but it's like, yeah. I just want my kids to be happy. Yeah. Really, well, what if that meant that they were a criminal? Mm -hmm. or, or what if they just loved drugs? Would, you don't <laughs> want your kids to go take drugs, like, no right, matter how right. happy it seems to make yeah. them. You want something that's more fulfilling mm -hmm. for them. And what's what we are should be grateful for as Catholics is we have the truth. And in this case, the truth isn't that complicated, mm -hmm. right? God makes yeah. you a certain way. That was for a reason. He's got mm -hmm. a mission for your life, and that mm -hmm. gender, that that sexual, you know, reality is part of it. You were meant mm -hmm. to be a man. You were meant to be a woman, right. and to live out His destiny for you with that gender, mm -hmm. with that reality. Um, where it gets complicated is what are the ramifications of standing on your own two feet as a Catholic and saying, "I believe in God. I believe He made us this way, and I believe we're supposed to be that way." Then it gets very complicated. Yeah, but you know, you used a word um, that I think is really critical here: reality. And I, I work with people who are from all over the political spectrum, and I work with people who have uh, faith and no faith. And those who are sort of proud atheists and who are uh, not in support of these laws, whether it's the Equality Act or, or this push to transition kids based on their feelings and things, they say, the reason why is not because of some reason of faith. It's because of reality. And that as a culture, as a society, we can't lose you know, our, our grasp of what's true and, and what's false. Yeah. And the reality is you cannot change a person's sex. And sex is whole body, whole person. It's not just a matter of your hormone levels or, or body parts. You can't just sort of swap those out. Uh, it's, it's your whole body because it's your body's organization towards a reproductive role. And I think one reason why, to sort of circle back to your, your original question, you know, how did we get here? Why are we seeing this now? I think part of it is the fruit of uh, 20, 30, 40 years now of a culture that's forgotten that sex is related to reproduction. Yeah. And that our bodies, you know, our sexual so purpose true. and identity is related to that gift of being able uh, to reproduce. So, mm. I, I, but that's how biology defines sex. Yeah. It's according to your reproductive role. So this isn't, that's not a Catholic position per se. Yeah. It, it aligns with that's faith true. and reason go together, but it, it's based on the, the truth of the body. And so, you know, our, as a culture, I think we're, we're losing that um, consensus that reality matters and, yeah. and sort of like we're all putting on those uh, virtual reality glasses and right. going through life like it's how I feel it's what I see and and you have to sort of play along you have to be part of my game yeah and or my, my narrative you mentioned atheists which made me think well, one of my undergraduate degrees was in philosophy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I was always fascinated I went to a um, a public university mm -hmm. I was always surprised even the atheist professors the thing they could not tolerate in the classroom more than any other philosophy was relativism. Mm -hmm. You just kind of mm -hmm. make it up as you go along. They needed yeah. a principled stance. Like there, there had to be structure mm -hmm. to this thing, mm -hmm. even if it was hedonism or if it was Christianity. Like as long right. as you provided right. a principled argument, they kind of let you go with it. I feel like where we've gone as a society, we're not rooted in good sound principles and philosophy. And so ideas that are very relativistic or mm -hmm. make it up as you go along yeah. become very appealing to people. And out of that comes a tremendous amount of pressure for people to go along and to abandon their own yeah. firm foundation. Yeah. Uh, I don't watch it much, but Dr. Phil had a segment on transgenderism. I think it's because I've been researching mm -hmm. some of these things, mm -hmm. preparing for this interview, that this, this video came up. 
the backflips he is doing to try to rationalize transgenderism as being a, a good or something that we yeah. should agree to, because he had a, uh, a child of a parent on, um, and, and their, their parent on his show, and the, the mother was not accepting that their child was transgender. She said, mm-hmm. I, I gave birth to a boy. And, and so she kept reaffirming this basic yeah. truth, which mm-hmm. he, he could not overcome that. And he wordsmithed as much as he could. But that pressure is imposing itself into like our sports. Like mm-hmm. this would be one thing if it was just the way people chose to dress and the way right, they presented right. themselves on social media. But it finds itself into the workplace. It finds itself, but one of the most um, obvious places where this is nonsensical is in sports. Talk mm-hmm. a little bit about how that has kind of developed. I mean, Caitlyn Jenner has kind of made mm-hmm. this uh, more popular, uh, you know, went through the public transition and, and opposes, mm-hmm. you know, that that mm-hmm. kind of inequality that's created when you allow yeah. transgenderism to infiltrate sports. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's actually sort of an offshoot of, of where we're seeing this whole gender ideology being pushed through the schools. Mm-hmm. So what's happening is we have um, an increasing number of kids. In fact, there's been a startling spike in adolescents and, and young adults who are identifying as transgender. If you look at the, the research literature from 20, 30 years ago, those who identified as transgender were typically middle-aged men, and it was a you know a tenth of a percent of the population, or it was very young children who were confused and there was something going on in their lives. And now we're seeing this third um, bucket, so to speak, this, this third category of adolescents and young adults who are present, who never had confusion when they were little, but all of a sudden they're they're coming out and declaring this different identity at odds with their body, and and that's the direct result of what they're being taught in the schools, in in public education, but very much on social media and entertainment. If if you um, if you look at Snapchat, if you look at Instagram, if you look at TikTok, they're pushing this content to kids. So you have kids who reach that, that um, difficult time of adolescence, mm-hmm. right? Puberty uh, is, is a tough time yeah. because your body's going through changes, your emotions are swinging, you're, you're trying to navigate the social you want an aspects. Identity. Yeah. yeah, and you're trying to figure out who am I, how am I different or alike to my friends, my family, yeah. all those things. And then all of a sudden interjected into that is this kind of solution that here's who you can, you can self-define. You can be whoever you want to be. Your body really doesn't matter because we can we can sort of fix that. We can take care of that, and and kids, especially the most vulnerable kids, are the ones who have pre-existing mental health issues. Yeah. Um, kids who are on the autism spectrum, uh, you know, kids kids who are vulnerable for a variety of reasons already and are in pain. And I think that's something really important to acknowledge that a lot of the desire to transition is really rooted in in pain that's very real. And yet, with the culture and society and and what they're learning in school and and what increasingly a segment of the medical population is telling them is that, hey, we've got a solution to you. The reason why you're unhappy, the reason why you're struggling is because you're really transgender. And so come out, be who you are, define your own identity, and and we'll help you medically transition. So so the whole idea of of transgender athletes is really something that has grown and and come into the public uh, view very much because it's now coming up with younger people. It's not, you know, Bruce Jenner is, is the is the outlier yeah but but what we're seeing is now kids in high school kids in college middle school um you know those early professional athlete years that's where we're seeing the pressure to validate and to allow people um to identify as they want and to participate in sports according to that that self-perception that feeling regardless of body and, and the reason why, um, you know, I think someone like, like Bruce Jenner, Caitlin, as mm-hmm. he, he goes by now, is, you know, he's, his whole career was built on athletics. And he just cannot deny that there's a fundamental difference yeah. between males and females and that it's fundamentally unfair to females. Yeah. And especially once you hit puberty, you know, there are some differences oh, it's a, yeah. even before puberty. But by the time you, uh, a male goes through puberty and a female goes through puberty, you're talking major differences mm-hmm. so that their their body structure, their their ability to carry oxygen, their muscle 
um, mass and their their power, the bone power of their everything. bones, everything. Because again, whole body, whole person. Sex right, is, right, is about right. who you are. So as you go through puberty, it just does different things physically. And so when we look at um, the differences, for example, between uh, the best female athletes, and we look at it, particularly in track, that's an easy one to measure, right? If you look at the best female athletes, the top three, four hundred high school boys can beat their times yeah, because of that physical difference. Right. And so um, I, I think it's something people intuitively grasp. It brings us back, you know, this whole controversy yeah. over whether we should allow kids to compete according to their feelings and identity or according to their biological reality. I, I think that brings us back intuitively mm-hmm. to the fact that you know, we can't run away from and can't erase sexual difference. Yeah. And if someone's struggling with that, I, I think the better thing is to, to probe a little bit and, and find out why. You know, if, if there's real pain, what's, what's underlying that? Instead of encouraging kids to sort of run down this path with the mirage that it's somehow going to work out. A girl, if she takes testosterone, is really going to be a boy. No, she's not. Yeah. She's going to be a girl who ends up infertile. You know, maybe with a double mastectomy with facial hair and a dropped voice. And Which is not going to help whatever condition they had it's before. Not. It's going to make it considerably worse. Yeah. Like, and especially in today's society when it's celebrated. How do, you, how do you go back? How do you reverse course when you've yeah. gone down that road and you realize, I've been lied to? Mm-hmm. You can't, oh, I mean, especially if you're taking hormones and things, you can't mm-hmm. go back. But just in terms of the identity part of it, is you're now defined in a new way. And yeah. the, the mountain to climb for them mm-hmm. to embrace who God made them to be is even harder. Yeah, and that's something that even a number of psychologists and, and MDs have brought out, that one of the problems with encouraging particularly young children when they have a feeling of distress or or even a sureness that they are you know, the opposite sex, that if you allow that, if you encourage that, you're sort of putting them on a path of no return. And then especially if you give them puberty blockers, I mean, the stats are that 97 to 100% of those kids go on to cross sex hormones because they're making a, a psychosocial transition. It's like, oh, the adults in my life think that, yeah, that's really true. I really am a boy. And they're, you know, they're, they're thinking that way. They're living that way. They're, they're presenting that way. And then when they go down the medicalized path, it's fraught with harm and danger, and yet, how to go back? And, and there have been, there's a, a group of um, people, young people, um, called detransitioners as a category, and they're uh, usually, typically older teenagers or young adults who have fully transitioned. You know, they, they embrace this as the solution to their lives, their, their true identity, and then they got on the other side and they realized, still unhappy yeah still struggling you know what's going on here and and so for many of them that's when they seek real psychotherapy to figure out what's on going on underneath others just have sort of a moment of this is not working for me and we'll just quit the you know the opposite sex hormones but there are there are problems with that you know there there needs to be medical care designed yeah. for those people and and that was actually part of what came up in a um, there was a CBS special by Leslie Stahl just over the weekend and and she interviewed a couple of detransitioners and and that was that was their cry it was like i was rushed through this and and now here i am on the other side I'm they did that they showed that other side of it. That's yeah. That's it, it was good that they showed that. The unfortunate thing is, at the same time, they featured a psychologist and an MD, <laughs> yeah. and who were both um, males who identified as women. In oh, other okay. words, they're yeah. they're people who and and both of them um, participate in transitioning children. So right. so they have a vested monetary interest. And, and they're to children. It's like, it, it seems like such a crime. I mean, because you're, you're taking someone who is mm-hmm. not capable of making their own decisions and typically need con- <laughs> are not a- allowed to make those decisions even with parental consent I- yeah. you know in other in other areas mm-hmm. um, it, as a category obviously those who are struggling with gender dysphoria or th- mm-hmm. these issues of whether they should transition so to speak right. and so on they obviously lose out you know because they're not getting the help that they actually mm-hmm. need uh, there's another group all women seem to take yeah. the, the biggest um, brunt of this because it obviously impacts them in sports and it drives them out so leadership opportunities mm-hmm. and different things that that naturally occur within sports. I mean, sports help form a lot of people. I benefited greatly yeah. from it. But also, um, 
Talk about the impact we've seen it have on, you know, when it comes to like women's shelters and, mm -hmm. and different facilities mm -hmm. where it's typically women only for a good reason. It's a space they can go if they've been abused right. or mistreated or whatever, or are in great need, now suddenly are open to biological men. And we know that in some states they've kind of experimented with this and are mm -hmm. much further down the road than mm -hmm. we maybe have here mm -hmm. in the Diocese of Arlington. But um, what has been the cost? What has been? What have we seen in some of these places and, and when, when they've allowed it open to biological men? Yeah. So, you know, from from the sports point, which you brought up, you know, the mm -hmm. loss of opportunities and, and things like that, which is all the way up and down the line. The ones who get the attention are those who are who are losing the chance to be the champion because they're beaten out by a boy. But I think too of um, I played sports all my life, and I think of you know the girl who was the last one cut because a male gets that position, male who, who's identifying as a woman. So, so you have the opportunity cost in sports, but you have the safety issue um, as well that comes into play in women's prisons. We've had, I think it's in oh. California, where close to 300 male prisoners have now asked to be transferred. They're now identifying as female, and they're asking to be transferred to the women's prisons. And we've seen this before in Canada, in the UK, and uh, because some of those countries sort of made those transitions ahead of this. And, and what, what has turned out is you have men who are sex offenders. In many cases, they're, they're um, have been convicted of child porn issues, and yet they get into prison and they self-identify as female. And that's all they have to do, just self-identify. Well, that, there's no objective standard here. There's no, right. What did they say? Then, then just, you know it's true. Uh, and, and, right. Oh. It's, it's simply self-ID. And Are they getting transferred to women's yeah. prisons? Yeah. That now, in some so cases, I, I, I know in the U.K., because they were having problems with, no surprise, <laughs> male prisoners raping you know, female oh, prisoners, that they have created some um, units that are simply for males who identify as transgender because it's true once they start identifying that way and they want to express that and they want to grow their hair and put makeup on I, they suffer in the male uh, units yeah. you know they're they're subject to abuse but the answer is not to violate women's safety and privacy and spaces by allowing these males again mostly intact males it's not like yeah. they've they've gone through some castration or, or whatever they all they've done is self-identify and then they've got a quote, yeah. civil right to do that. So there's that situation. There's also the ordinary situation for um, for girls. You, one of the things as a mom you do when you're raising daughters is you try to teach your, your girls to trust their instincts. That mm. when there's a dangerous situation, when they perceive something that's just not right, they should pay attention to that. Yeah. And yet what we have under, for example, the Equality Act, is there's a specific, there's specific language in the Equality Act that says access to bathrooms, locker rooms, changing facilities is on the basis of gender identity. Again, gender identity is self-perception, is how I think of myself. So any male, whether he's sporting long hair or short hair or wearing male clothes or female clothes, can walk into a locker room, a girls' restroom, and this this is occurring and has occurred in different states that have these provisions. But under the Equality Act, it, it would be everywhere. Um, he walks in, and the adolescent girl, let's just imagine a 13-year-old, she's like, what is this guy doing in here? And he's, he's saying, I'm a woman. I get to be here. What does she do? What does she do? You know, our instincts... Uh, or what we want to cultivate in her is a healthy self-protection that says, when I'm in a vulnerable place, you know, where, where you're attending to female needs and intimate needs and, and it's, it's a private space, I don't want to be alone here with a male who's bigger, stronger. Um, I don't know him. He may have all the right intentions, but we're teaching them that their feelings don't matter, their instincts don't matter, that we're not concerned about their safety. And again, it's not to say that every person who identifies as transgender and is looking for a bathroom that matches their feelings is, some, is a criminal. That's not the point. The point is this opens the door mm -hmm. for anyone, and we are seeing perpetrators taking advantage of that. And it's it's one of those things where I feel like again, <laughs> got a in philosophy you can you can philosophize all kinds of fascinating mm -hmm. nonsense. That's just yeah. that yeah. you you know it's like it's fun to talk about, but the logical end is not something we could live with. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. Descartes, you know, said I can think about these things from my armchair. I can't walk on the street and think this way. <laughs> I've got to know that yeah. things are real. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, 
I, I feel like there are people who want to be sensitive to mm-hmm. people who have gender dysphoria or they feel transgendered and they, they want to go along. So the, like mm-hmm. the Equality Act, I think they would instinctively say, yeah, let's do that. Mm-hmm. But then a man enters a women's division of a mixed martial arts tournament mm-hmm. and all of a sudden they feel very differently about it. Yeah. A, a man walks in who, let's say, clearly isn't transgender. They're just manipulating the system and saying, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm a woman. Walking into a women's locker room, they're... They're smart people. They know that's a bad idea. Like right. there's something inherently flawed mm-hmm. in this, but they want to be sensitive. Mm-hmm. What is the like maybe the most compassionate way to articulate our position, which speaks to the person who recognize who who is sensitive to the, the these folks and their in, in their situation, um, but they are also very concerned about what they're mm-hmm. seeing play out in sports, where it mm-hmm. becomes very obvious this the logical right. conclusion of this is not something we want mm-hmm. to live with. Mm-hmm. What's the most sensitive way to convey the, the the position? I think one we treat everyone with kindness, we acknowledge mm-hmm. every person's dignity, but we also, um, in a healthy way, draw boundaries. And so I'll, I'll give you an example of that. There was a um, a women's shelter in. Alaska that um, was actually sued for violating the the local anti-discrimination laws because there was a man who was identifying as a woman who came to the shelter they provided food and but when it came time to sleep they said you cannot stay here we have women here who are vulnerable who are victims of sexual violence we can't have a male in this room we'll help you find a room at the you know the the shelter that cares for men and he didn't want it, and the shelter was sued. So they were trying. It wasn't like they were saying, uh, we don't care about you and go freeze on the street. Not, th- not at all. They were trying to care for this individual, but they drew an appropriate boundary mm-hmm. that said, you know what, in spite of how you feel, <laughs> you, you are biologically a male, and we have the right to draw that boundary so that the safety and privacy of our females who are very vulnerable in this particular shelter it, are respected and we'll arrange something else for you but here's where the politics comes in the politics says no that's not good enough i need to be validated according to my gender identity i have a right to be in all these spaces and that's what the equality act does it does not allow us you know reasonable people to care for people who are vulnerable to figure out you know what's a way to care for them but also to respect the, the legitimate needs particularly of women for privacy and safety um, that's all gone that's all gone it, under the equality act and similar types of state laws it's very dangerous whether it succeeds or not in this form we know it's going to come back so it's important to have this conversation and to yeah. understand it better mary i want to be respectful of your time but is there anything i missed that people really need to know that i didn't dig into you know the only thing i would say and this is perhaps the most important thing is for people to realize we're all struggling with all sorts of things and the fact that someone has um, issues around identity or, or struggles with sexual identity doesn't make them you know less than uh, we love them. Of course. They have this. They're equal in dignity, and and that's that's our starting place as Catholics. You know, to see them as as human beings who are God's treasures and need to be cared for, and yet, just as every parent knows, every person in a personal relationship knows, you have to draw healthy boundaries. And when someone is asking for things that don't conform to reality or that overstep and can cause harm to themselves or to others, that's where you have to be strong and say, no, look, here's the truth. Here's what's good. And let me help you get there. Yeah. Not not abandoning people as Pope Francis, you know, cautioned in one of his one of his comments on, on this issue. He said, A company, don't abandon. Yeah. And yet at the same time, eyes wide open about the ideology behind it and draw those lines and, and uh, advocate for the truth. That's wonderful. Mary, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your work. I mean, you're on the front lines of this day in and out. You know, we're kind of diving in here and (laughs) capturing the the, the cream of the crop here in terms of uh, what you know about this. But you're you're dealing with this every day. Thank you for fighting these battles and for for working so hard for the truth. Yeah, people who are interested can go to personandidentity.com. We have a website that's designed to help uh, individuals, um, parishes, schools navigate uh, this issue. So, and if you want to learn more about the Ethics and Public Policy Center, just uh, Google them up. But yeah. it's again Ethics and Public Policy Center. Mary, thank you so much for joining. Thanks us. so much. You're listening to Searching for More. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write a review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Also, make sure you follow the Diocese and the Arlington Catholic Herald on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
and subscribe to our YouTube channels for regular videos that inspire, educate, and inform about the Catholic faith in our diocesan community.